All right, we're in Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30, if you have a Bible, find me there. It's been a little bit of a wild saga with our friend Jacob here, one of the patriarchs. Last week we looked at chapter 29 and the first, or the end of 29 and then the first part of 30 about the sons and daughter that were born to him. So just to catch you up, remember Jacob had to leave his homeland, the promised land. This is important for tonight's study. He had to leave the promised land because his brother Esau was going to kill him because he had stolen Esau's birthright. His mom tells his dad, send Jacob back to my homeland, which is called Padan Aram, so he can find a wife, so he doesn't marry one of these Canaanites like his brother did, and they're driving me crazy. And so he goes, he, by divine providence, on his way there, he meets with the Lord in a dream. The Lord speaks to him in a place called Bethel. Then he's heading that direction, and he finds some shepherds, and he connects with his uncle, his wife's, his, his mother's brother, and meets his cousin, his mother's brother's daughter, and uh, he wants to marry her. Her name's Rachel. Remember, he tells his new father-in-law, or father-in-law to be, that he'll work for him for seven years. Doesn't have anything to offer for her, any kind of dowry to pay. But he says, "I'll work for you for seven years if I can marry Rachel." Last minute, on the right when the honeymoon was about to start, you know, uh, his father-in-law sneaks not Rachel in there, but Leah in there, his, uh, Rachel's older sister. And so uh, Laban it, tricks him, Laban the trickster. And so uh, he says, that's all right, you can, you can, you can marry uh, Rachel too, just work another seven years. And so what Jacob gets is two wives for the price of two. <laughs> right, two. It's a, which is funny because, you know, he doesn't even negotiate. Did you ever notice that? Seven years for Rachel, the beloved wife he really likes, he gets kind of stuck with Leah. He didn't really want her. But he said, I just work another seven years. And, and Jacob just kind of goes along with it. You know, you'd think he said, okay, I'll do three and a half for Leah. You know, I mean, you'd think he would have nothing. He just says, okay. He just and that's what we've been seeing with Jacob. He just kind of goes with the flow. Whatever Things happen to Jacob. All right? He's not a leader. He's kind of a passive, just floating along, letting things happen to him. Father-in-law takes advantage of him. He doesn't do anything. His wives tell him one thing, tell him another. They're leading the household. He doesn't do anything. His wife uh, says, here, take my, my servant as your wife. And he says, mm, okay. And then, and then there you go. And so he ends up with, he goes there with nothing. And at this point, he's got four wives, you know, two wives and two uh, servants that become wives. He's got 11 sons and one daughter that we know of. Often daughters aren't, aren't always mentioned here, but we know Dinah is mentioned uh, here. And so um, that's where he's at. Now, I mentioned to you last week, if you were here, um, Jacob should have kind of uh, strengthened himself a little bit here, sought the Lord before he made some of the decisions that he made, for example, taking on these extra wives. And he should have told his wife, no. But then on Sunday, it was great. If you were here, I balanced it out, right? Pilate, on the other hand, should have listened to his wife. She said, don't have anything to do with this righteous man, Jesus. So this is why you need to come on Sundays and Wednesdays. Am I right? Amen. All right. Well, we get to see a little bit, in, in starting in 31, if we have time tonight. Um, this is a really long saga that takes place here. So we'll see where we get. Okay, I'll watch the time. But um, Jacob, in, in chapter 31, just starts starts to lead a little bit, all right? He just starts to, to stand up to his father-in-law and to, to lead his wives, and so hopefully you see that. So we'll let's look at chapter 30 uh, tonight, starting in verse 25, and uh, what we see here is uh, the showdown of the tricksters, Jacob and Laban, or the contest of the con artists, whatever you prefer. All right, chapter 30, verse 25 says this, "'After Rachel gave birth to Joseph,' Jacob said to Laban, send me on my way so that I can return to my homeland and give me my wives and my children that I have worked for and let me go. You know how hard I've worked for you. But Laban said to him, if I have found favor with you, stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Then Laban said, name your wages and I'll pay them. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your herds have fared with me. For you had very little before I came, but now your wealth has increased. The Lord has blessed us because of me, or blessed you because of me. And now, when will I also do something for my own family? 
Okay, so let's uh, take a quick break there and just look at uh, what's happened so far. So after Joseph is born, very important, Joseph becomes a big character later. Jacob finally goes to Laban and says, hey, send me home. You know, I've worked the 14. The 14 years are over. Let me go back to my homeland. Now, you know, he's worked and, and paid off what he owes to his father-in-law. But you'll see in chapter 31 why he can't just pick up and leave. He really needs the blessing of Laban before he's able to leave uh, or else Laban won't let him leave. That's, that's really what's happening here. And, and that's what he wants. That's in his heart. That's a desire in his heart. He wants to go back home. That's where he's from. And that's a good thing. This is the patriarch wanting to go back to the promised land. That's where we want the patriarchs to be in the promised land. He says this, you know how hard I've worked for you. Now I want to take a minute because it's mentioned about three times here. You have these um, indications to us or mentions uh, to us that Jacob was a hard worker. Now, I got to mention that because I've made fun of him a lot. And I've kind of put him down a bunch. We see a lot of his negative characteristics. But one thing about him is he's a hard worker. He's a hardworking guy. Uh, he says that to his boss. Hey, you know I'm a hard worker. You don't say that to the boss if you're not a hard worker. Because Laban could have said, no, you're lazy and you don't show up on time. But he says, he says you know, you know how hard I've worked. He's going to say the same thing to his wife, uh, his wife's in chapter 31. He also, by the way, back in 29, chapter 29, remember, his, uh, he, he, he shows up and sees these shepherds around the well at noontime. He says, why are y'all standing around? It's only midday. Might be an indication that, that he was saying, you guys need to get to work. You're being lazy. So he's a hard worker. I'll point that out another time. But he has to, to go home. I've worked hard. Let me go home. Remember, this was a mama's boy. He wants to go back and see his mama. This is a... Um, this is a man of the tent, okay? A, a homebody, not a homeboy, a home body. And that's what he wants. And Laban says, no, stay. Come on, stay. If I found favor with you, stay. Now, at this point in the story, we want to give Laban the benefit of the doubt and just say, you know what? He's a grandpa. He doesn't want his kids and his grandkids to move far away. Some of y'all could maybe relate to that or amen that. You want your grandbabies close by? But that's not what's happening here. Laban is a wicked man, okay? He's, he's a pretty evil guy, uh, and Jacob is a means to an end for him. So are his children and probably his grandchildren, uh, and we see that more and more. He just is going to take advantage of Jacob as long as Jacob lets him take advantage of him. And so, but he admits that he has grown wealthy because of Jacob. He also says um, to him, um, that he has learned by, by divination, it says. Some translate that experience, but I think it's really probably divination. Um, the, it says, the Lord has blessed me because of you, um, and, 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 and through divination I found that out. So divination is uh, sorcery. It's witchcraft, by the way. It's, it's forbidden all throughout the Bible, all throughout. So it's, it's just interesting. I point that out. It says that the Lord, uh, I've been shown through divination that I am blessed by, by the Lord because of you. So that's kind of, you know, uh, interesting. So he would consult whatever fake gods or whatever he prayed to and, and have different means of divination, uh, sometimes with sticks or cups or different things are used and mentioned in the Bible. And it's through divination that he finds out that the Lord has blessed him because of Jacob. So it's kind of an interesting thing here. Now, uh, here, here's why, you know, if we're going to really boil this down, we know what exists in the world, in the supernatural world. We know there's people, that's us, right? And then there's angels, and there's demons. And there's God, the Father, in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and there's the devil. And that's it. Okay, so when he says, when he says through divination he's learned this, who told him? Yeah, it wasn't an angel, right? <laughs> it wasn't the Lord. It's a demon, most likely. It's a demon. So it's just crazy. It's like, hey, the devil told me that the Lord is blessing me because of you. Isn't that interesting? And James chapter 2 says that uh, even the demons believe in one God and they shudder. And when Jesus confronts demons in the Gospels, they know who he is. So it's just interesting that it's the demons, essentially, then, that identify the source of Laban's 
blessing. But that's all there is. You know, so if, if somebody tells you that they can contact ghosts or other gods or other entities or whatever, you just need to understand, if you're a Christian, you understand it's demons. If the Ouija board talks back, it's a demon. That's what it is, okay? And so that's, that's just interesting that that is the source of his knowledge and his information here. Um, also, it tells us that uh, he practices divination, which means he's a, not a follower of God. We see that also in chapter 31, he has these household idols that Rachel is going to steal. Uh, spoiler alert there, but, but she steals these idols. So he's got household idols. He practices divination. This is the kind of guy that he is. But it's, but it's through this divination that he understands the Lord has blessed him because of Jacob. This is the third time we've seen that. Abraham, uh, Abimelech was blessed because of Abraham. Then Isaac, same thing. Now we see Jacob being a blessing to Laban because God is blessing Jacob. We'll see it again with Joseph. Remember in Potiphar's household? Potiphar is blessed, why? Because of Joseph. So there's this idea, this principle that we get in the covenant with Abraham that's passed on to Isaac and Jacob is that he'll bless those who bless you. God says, I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. And this is what, what we're seeing here with Laban. It's uh, just what, we, what I've called uh, collateral blessing. You know, it's kind of an overflow of blessing. God blessing Jacob, and it just blesses other people in the meantime. Now, um, here's a little point of application. Let me ask you this question. Um, is your workplace blessed because you're there. Some of you said, I'm retired, so whew, missed that one. Okay. <laughs> Is your family blessed because you're in it? Is your home blessed? If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be a blessing wherever God puts you. Isn't that true? Your workplace, your home, your, you know, wherever you go, whatever clubs you're a part of, are you, are you a light in the darkness, are you salt and light like Jesus told us to be? Is what we see. Jacob's not even a really a very good follower of the Lord, yet he is still a blessing to those around him. We should be as well. And it's not that um, just that we should be a blessing. Like, man, man, this is a better place since old Joe started working here. It's not just that. It's old Joe is a believer, and we're blessed being around him because God is blessing him. Right? Where it, the, the, the way we are a blessing to those around us is supposed to be a testimony to God, not to us. Right? Right? So, so uh, unfortunately, people might look at your life and might be around you. They might experience the blessing that you have to offer, and they might attribute that to you being a good old boy. You know, like, man, this is a great person. They just a, just a fun a- a attitude, or they have the right perspective on life. We got to make sure people understand that the way we are is because of what God has done in us and what he's doing through us. It's a testimony. Laban realized that, as wicked as he is, practicing sorcery, he sees it. And so uh, Jacob tells him, listen, I've worked hard for you. I've, I've built you up. You were nothing. You had little when I got here. Now you are wealthy. When am I going to be able to do something for my own family? I've been building up your kingdom been building up your household, Laban. I'm ready to build up mine a little bit. And, you know, it's interesting. Laban just kind of skips over what he says and says, listen, name your wages and I'll pay you. We get in chapter 31 and we see what Laban has done with his wages. He's changed them a bunch of different times. And so that's not very trustworthy. Also, also a little point, you know, uh, uh, be careful when evil people try to give you things, right? It's always got strings attached and that's what's happening here. Um, he's like, I'll pay you. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, don't trust that. And so Jacob comes up with a plan. Uh, verse 31. Uh, verse 31, he says, Laban asked, what should I give you? And Jacob said, you don't need to give me anything. If you do this one thing for me, I'll continue to shepherd and keep your flock. So he's got a plan. Verse 32, we're going to see Jacob's plan for payment. Here's what it says. Let me go through all your sheep today and remove every sheep that is speckled or spouted, spotted, every dark colored sheep, among the lambs and the spotted and speckled ones among the female goats, such will be my wages. In the future, when you come to check on my wages, my honesty will testify for me. If I have any female goats that are not speckled or spotted, or any lambs that are not black, they will be considered stolen. 
Good, said Laban. Let it be as you have said. So here, here we have Laban, uh, you know, customarily saying, yeah, that sounds great. And he likes to go back on these deals. And so in verse 35, you see kind of Laban's trickery here. It says, that day Laban removed the streaked and spotted males and goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats and every one that had any white on it and every dark colored one among the lambs. And he placed his sons in charge of them and he put a three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob, meanwhile, was shepherding the rest of Laban's flock. It's like, wait, what? I thought we had a deal. And so some people say, oh, what they meant there was any other uh, spotted goats or sheep that are born or streaked sheep or goats, um, in the future he would get. But that's not what he says. What he says is, listen, I'll take all the spotted ones with me, and, and you can have the rest. All the good ones, the bl- ones without blemishes are all yours. That's the most valuable ones. And they were thought to be the strongest, the best genetics and that kind of thing. And uh, that way you'll know if, if I ever in the future you catch me with a, a perfectly white, spotless sheep or goat, you'll know it's yours and I've stolen it. So that's how you'll know. Well, Laban goes through and takes all those. And so it says that day, that day he removed those and put them three days away from Jacob. So Jacob, it says, then, then uh, meanwhile, well, Jacob was shepherding the rest of Laban's flock. Jacob then took branches. So, so that's, um, that's Laban's, or, yeah, Laban's uh, move, okay? Moves and counter moves, right? That's what we'll see here. This kind of back and forth duel between Jacob and Laban. That was, that was Laban's trickery, okay? He did that part of the plan, didn't live up to his part of the plan. Look what Jacob does. This is weird. I'm going to throw that out there right off the bat. Jacob then took branches off fresh poplar, almond, and plain wood and peeled the bark, exposing white stripes on the branches. He set the peeled branches in, front, in troughs in front of the sheep in the water channels where the sheep came to drink. And the sheep bred when they came to drink. The flocks bred in front of the branches and bore streaked spots, speckled and spotted young. Jacob separated lambs and made flocks, flocks face the streaked sheep and completely dark sheep in Laban's flock. Then he set his own stock apart and didn't put them with Laban's sheep. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob placed the branches in the troughs in full view of the flocks, and they would breed in front of the branches. As for the weaklings of the flock, he did not put out the branches. So it turned out the weak sheep belonged to Laban and the stronger ones to Jacob, and the man became very rich. He had many flocks, female and male slaves, and camels and donkeys. <clears throat> so do we have any experts in uh, sheep and goat husbandry in the room tonight? Okay, did y'all know you could do that? Did y'all know all you had to do was get a branch and strip the bark off, and you could see the streaks on the branch, and if you put that in front of the animals, well, during breeding time, it would cause the, the little baby goat and sheep inside of them to come out looking like that branch with streaks and spots. Did you know that would work? Well, now you do, okay? You start a revolutionary company with spotted and streaked goats if you want to. But um, here's what you need to understand. <clears throat> that didn't work. That was Jacob's plan, right? That was Jacob's plan, but it didn't work. And it's interesting. We've seen this twice now, right? That uh, in, this, in this chapter, as a matter of fact, you see two times where um, the people, once was Rachel and Leah with the mandrakes, and here we have another time with the poplar wood. They use these kind of uh, natural remedies or uh, herbal medicine or whatever you want to call it. Uh, maybe, maybe old wives' tales or whatever you want to call it to fix a, an issue with fertility or to change something with fertility. The mandrakes for Rachel, um, the, the poplar wood and all this. And so uh, both of these things don't work. Mandrakes don't increase your fertility and um, showing an animal different kinds of wood when they're breeding doesn't change the, what the animal's going to look like when it's born. Twice, it's interesting, you have twice in this chapter the, the same thing, the same kind of idea. Both those don't really work. But it's interesting because <clears throat> as you read that, it says, and the man became very rich, and he had many flocks, female and male slaves, camels and donkeys. So um, it didn't work. His plan didn't work. And yet... He still becomes rich. Now, I want to point this out about Jacob. Once again, we see it. 
at least he's doing something, right? I mean, this is a weird plan, um, but you see him finally start to, he stands up to Laban a little bit. He comes up with a plan. It isn't a good plan, but it's a plan. Now, um, unfortunately, so far in Jacob's life, the only time we see him really be proactive about something is when he's trying to trick somebody. Meanwhile, his house is in shambles, right? We saw that last week. Meanwhile, he's got wives fighting one another, and uh, got four of them now, and th- things are crazy at home. But boy, he's focused at work. I guess that's at least one admirable characteristic. It's not good to be focused at work and to be working on uh, your wealth and building up your own kingdom while your household's falling apart. But goodness gracious, at least Jacob is doing something for once. He seems to be hard at the task of tricking his father-in-law, who in all fairness is also tricking him. And so he, he tries this um, scheme and he becomes, he becomes rich. He becomes rich. It's just interesting though, you know, his, his motivation so far has been go home. Get back to the promised land. Get back to the promised land. Um, and now he's going to do it with quite a bit of, of wealth to boot. Um, I think for us though, you know, our motivation in this life, if I can make application from his life, should be to get home, not to get rich. And what I mean is, you know, you can spend a lot of your time and your energy and you can try to build up your kingdom here on earth as much as you can, and then ultimately it's going to be left to somebody else. Your motivation should really be to get home. That's what Jacob's trying to do. He's trying to get back to the promised land. And for us, if you're a Christian, your home, your citizenship is in heaven, right? That should be our goal. That should be our aim is to get home, not to build up our kingdom here on earth. Well, let's get into 31 just a little bit here. Here's what it says. Now, uh, so he's gotten rich. Now, here's, here's the fallout from that. Now, Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Chapter, chapter 31, verse 1. Jacob has taken all of our fathers, uh, all that was our fathers, and has built his wealth from what belongs to our father. And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude toward him was not the same as before. So Laban's sons and Laban's face are giving him away, are telling him he's not happy. Of course he's not happy. Laban tried to trick Jacob, he tried to get some more years' worth of labor out of, him, out of him to build up his wealth off of Jacob's back even more than he already has, and it hasn't worked. And we know, by the way, this, uh, the scheme with the flocks, that was about six years' worth of time. So at this point in the story, in 31, it says it here in just a little bit, Jacob has been working for Laban for 20 years. 14 years for the wives, six years for the flocks. 20 years. And uh, in these last six years, when they had this plan with the spotted sheep and the goats, Laban has gotten poorer and Jacob has gotten richer. Now, I want to point that out to say this, that may be the other side of the covenant blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And what's the other side? Yeah, maybe Laban's cursed because he's trying to take advantage even more of Jacob. And so it seems that um, Jacob's sons are upset. And they say this, he's taken our father's wealth. That was going to be their wealth one day, right? That was going to be their inheritance. And they're mad because they feel like their brother-in-law has stolen it from their father. But we know that's not true. What we know is that Laban only had it because God had blessed him through Jacob. We, we know that when, before Jacob got there, Laban didn't have hardly anything. Jacob just said that. And so uh, they're not true, they're not right, um, but they're upset. And then you saw that Laban's face, or um, his nonverbals, right? He's, he's, he's changed. Now, what he's saying is still the same. It's just the way Laban's talking to Jacob um, tells him that, you know what, uh, he's mad. He's upset. Doesn't feel about him the way he used to, to feel about him. And so then it, it says this. The Lord said to him, Go back to the land of your father and your family, and I'll be with you. So earlier, which means about six years earlier, Jacob wanted to go back home. He had it in his heart to go back home. That was the plan all along. And now it seems the Lord has spoken to Jacob and commanded him, hey, time's up. It's time to go. It's time to go. So it's interesting. You know, you think um, maybe six years earlier, it was the Lord that had put that on Jacob's heart, that desire to go home. And now He's given him the command to follow through. He's going to make a way for that to take place. But before he could do that, he had to what? Build up his flocks. 
If he left six years ago, he was going to go empty-handed with his family, and that's it. Now he's going to go back home rich, flocks and herds, and uh, really well taken care of. Lord tells him to. So listen to this. Then Jacob had Rachel and Leah uh, called to the field where his flocks were. So he, he calls Jacob, I mean Jacob, Rachel and Leah out to the field where he's at, and he said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude towards me is not the same as before, but the God of my fathers has been with me. You know what, with, that with all my strength I have served your father, and he has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God has not let him harm me. Did you hear that? Y'all need to get another pudding back there and get woke up. This is a different Jacob. Right? Here's what he says. He says that, uh, first of all, first of all, we see a little leadership in the home, right? He's got the wives out there, and we're having a family meeting here. This is great. And he says to them that, you're, you know, listen, I can tell from your father things aren't good. And he says this, is, once again, it's hard work. You know with all my strength I have served your father. So that's the second time we've seen that uh, here tonight. Uh, he's a hard worker. And then listen, and that he has cheated me and changed my wages 10 times. How would you like a boss who changed your wages 10 times? Listen, I bet you he didn't raise them 10 times. You know what I mean? He probably lowered them. Like what if you were working off commission and then you made a bunch of good sales and the boss said, yeah, I know I told you uh, 8%. We're only going to do two. We can only do two. Per-, you know? Yeah, shoot him. That's a good idea. That's a good way to go to jail. All right, <laughs> Right, like who would you so there who would you complain to if you're Jacob? Right now we have Better Business Bureau or something like that. There's lawyers you could call. Here he just has to kind of take it. He can leave or he can take it. And he's just taking it over and over and over. But he says this, but God has not let him harm me. He also says to his wives that uh, the God of my fathers has been with me. It, it, it gets even better. If he said, but God has not let him harm me. If he had said the spotted sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born spotted. And if he said the streaked ones will be your wages, then all the sheep will be born streaked. And God has taken away your father's herds, and he has given them to me. When the flocks were breeding, I saw in a dream. So he had another dream, Jacob the dreamer, that the streaked, spotted, and speckled males were mating with the females. And that dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob. And I said, here I am. And he said, look up and see all the males that are mating with the flocks are streaked, spotted, and speckled, for I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you poured oil on the stone marker and made a solemn vow to me. Get up and leave this land and return to your homeland. So Jacob has another dream. Uh, He relays this to his wives. He calls them out, and he tells um, them that that, uh, he had a dream. And in this dream, the Lord showed him why his plan worked. It wasn't because of the poplar wood and all that. He showed him that it was the Lord's hand of provision and protection over him that caused the sheep to breed in a way that would be beneficial to him and detrimental to his father-in-law. He also tells him that uh, I'm the God of Bethel. Now, Bethel, remember, is the place where he had that first dream with the ladder. He says, that the God you encountered in the wilderness 20 years ago, to whom you made a solemn vow, that's me. And, and, and by bringing up that vow, you know, remember that vow was uh, Jacob made to God just really quickly. Listen, if you do everything you've promised to do, if you really take care of me, and if you really provide for me, and if you're really with me, then I'll worship you and you'll be my God. Remember, that's what Jacob's vow was. And God is saying, look, I did it. Look, look, right? So now you got to do it. Hold up your end of the, va- the, the vow. Now, it's just interesting that he points this out. Laban took advantage of me. He mistreated me. He mishandled me. He stole from me. I mean, Laban is stealing from Jacob. Jacob is married to Laban's daughters, and he's the father of Laban's grandchildren. So really, Laban is stealing from his own grandchildren and his own daughters. He's a sorry dude, right? I mean, he's a bad guy. And, and so, but, but, but Jacob says, look, look, Laban did everything he could, but God wouldn't let him harm me. Right? Like Jacob could have fought with Laban, 
But it'd be a lot better for God to fight with Laban than for Jacob to fight with Laban. And how often do we find in ourselves in situations where somebody's against us, somebody's harming us, somebody's uh, taking advantage of us, and we can go to battle, we can go to war. Be a lot better to let God do it, though, huh? So God speaks in this dream and shows him that his, his breeding technique with the wood, that didn't really work. It was really the Lord's blessing. And uh, so he continues, um, leave this land, go home. Now listen to this, verse 14. Okay, I got time. Y'all, I got time. I'm going to get where I wanted to be. Okay. Verse 14, then Rachel and Leah answered him. Okay, so this is the first time Jacob's going to step up a little bit and try to lead his wives. They've been leading the ship, the, you know, they've been captaining the ship so far. They've been leading the house. So here's, here's how, let's see how that goes. Then Rachel and Leah answered him, do we have any portion or inheritance in our father's family? Are we not regarded to him as outsiders? That's how he treats his daughters. Are we not uh, regarded? For he has sold us and has certainly spent our purchase price. Now, uh, what's happening there is, a, is the, the idea of a dowry. A father was to take a dowry from a, a prospective suitor of his daughters, and he was supposed to hold that money for her. That way, if the husband divorced her or died, she would be financially compensated and be able to take care of herself you know, for a while. Well, <clears throat> this guy it says that he has uh, sold his daughters off. I mean, and, and he really did, right? He just tricked Jacob with Leah, and then threw Rachel in with the deal. Terrible. Terrible. These are human beings. And he took in exchange for them, what? Labor. Labor. How are they going to cash that check later? You know what I mean? They, they can't do it. He's not reserved for them anything in case things don't work out. So he sold them, treated them as outsiders, and spent the purchase price. In fact, listen to this, all the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. So do whatever God has said to you. So do whatever God has said to you. So, wow, what a great example. I mean, li- listen, listen, he leads them, and what do they do? They follow him. They follow him. He leads them, and they follow him. He steps up to the plate, and they do too. And so here, I, we point this out. You know, the Bible talks about uh, wives submitting to husbands, husbands loving their wife as Christ loved the church. And you hear this from couples all the time. Well, my husband's sorry. He won't lead us for nothing. I'd give anything to have a spiritual leader in the household. But if he ever steps up and leads, are you going to let him? Or are you going to second guess every decision he makes? You sure? I don't know about that. Are you sure? You sure? Listen, they saw that the Lord had been active in Jacob's life, that the Lord was behind all this. And they could confidently say to him, do as the Lord says to do. If you're a single person in here today, I don't know if we have any single people here tonight, but listen, you should marry a person that you can confidently say that to. Do as the Lord would have you do. And not be worried that they're going to try to take advantage of that situation, right? Like, honey, the Lord told me to buy that bass boat. I didn't want to, but the Lord told me, right? Like, you just, you know, hey. But yeah, so, so he finally steps up and lead. And by the way, on the opposite side, of that, I hear men say, well, my wife will never follow me. She won't listen to me. She won't da 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 And I don't know. Jacob finally steps up, and what happens? His wives follow him. Maybe if you'll be a spiritual leader and show them you walk with the Lord and you have a relationship with the Lord, maybe they'll follow you. Maybe they'll do it just like here. What an example. And they do it. And they say, look, we recognize that it's God that has done all this. And so Jacob's going to go. They're going to leave. Now, let me just uh, stop us there uh, and let me close with this right here. Now, listen, uh, Jacob uh, had a father-in-law that took advantage of him. But he had a father in heaven that took care of him. And that's the motto here. People might take advantage of you, but listen, are we relying on ourselves to provide for ourselves or others? Or are we going to trust in the Lord to do so? Let me read you a Psalms. It says this, Psalm chapter 20, verse 3. It says this, Do not trust in nobles, in a son of a man who cannot save. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. And on that day, his plans die. Happy is the one whose help 
is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the seas and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Amen.